For those of you that are with us uh, out here today, uh, I want to invite you, for those that are watching us uh, online, thank you guys for coming. And today, I wanted to talk about the heart of a rescuer. And today, I'm going to share a couple of stories. And if you've been a part of our church for an extended period of time, you may have heard these stories before. But nonetheless, they are very appropriate for what we're going to be talking about today. So I've had a hobby for more than 30 years now of whitewater rafting. Most of you guys know that. And I want to tell you a story about the first ever expedition trip we did with our family. This is before we had kids. This was 30 years ago. What's an expedition trip? Well, that's where, you know, when you go car camping and everything you load in your car, the stove, the tent, all that stuff. Well, we load all of that up into a raft, and we put a rowing frame on there with oars, and when you push offshore, you're not going to be seeing your car again for the next three days. In fact, you pay somebody to move your car down river for you because you're going to be pulling out like 50 miles down river. So we're on our first trip like that. It's going wonderful, and it was the evening of our second night. And if you've ever been over there, high desert of, you know, the Deschutes River Valley, those storms that can kick in, they can be intense. And so that's exactly what happened. The, the wind just started to blow. All of our stuff, it's blowing around. We're, we're tying down our boats. We're tying down our stuff, tying down a cooler to keep it from just blowing across the camp. And with that, we start to see the the lightning strikes as they're striking all around the hillside around us because we're at the bottom of this river valley and you could you could see them striking the ground intimidating and then the then the rain begins to drive down and what it did is it leveled our camp it wiped out all the tents except for one the tent that I had brought which was a geodestic dome tent which is designed to handle high winds so I yelled to our group I said everybody get in the tent get in the tent and we jump in the tent we zip it up as the wind and the and the lightning and the the rain is driving all around us and I do a quick head to head count and I notice hey somebody's missing and so I zip it just a little bit and I peek out and I see Brett Brett's one of the guys that's with us, and he's out there with his tent, which has now been obliterated. How many of you know uh, tents with metal poles don't do well in the wind, right? So these, these poles are sheared in half. They're bent like boom. It's a mess. And he's out there with the only pole that's remaining intact. And he's holding it up like this, right in the middle, as the tent is just drooping all around it. It looked like a scene from a movie. Because as the wind's blowing his hair's back, and the rain is just driving on his face, and I could see the lightning flashing right behind him and creating this silhouette as the sun is going down. And he's out there holding this metal rod during a lightning storm, singing, Our God is an awesome God, he reigns. And I yell, Brett, drop the lightning rod. Get in here. <laughs> it didn't take long before the storm cleared and it warmed back up and things dried out. And we got a good night's sleep. But the next morning, now we were camping. We're near the last leg of our trip. But we're actually at the start of where people from Portland flood over there for the day trip, where there's the more exciting white water. And so that's right where we camped. And so you have all these people that are driving over in the morning. It's blue sky. It's calm. It's clear. They have no idea what had happened the night before. And in fact, you would have had to been there to know that anything had happened. We could recognize that the river was up a little bit. You could see a little bit of the, the chocolate color in the water. And the current was moving a little faster. So we load up our rafts. We head down. And because they're loaded with everything we own, just about, including the kitchen sink, it seemed like. We didn't notice really the, the increased water flow until we got down to the biggest rapid, Oak Springs. Who's been down to Oak Springs with me before? A few of you guys have, right? 
Now, Oak Springs, it's a big, solid, class four rapid. It probably drops about six, maybe even eight feet into this vortex where the water curls in on itself and it just drops. It's this thundering white water with this deep hole, this, this crease, this vortex that's there. And uh, customarily do, we got out, we pulled the raft over, and we walked out to scout the rapid. So we walk up onto this gravel bar that's right along the road there. And there's about 50 other people standing up there. And they're all looking at the rapid. Everybody kind of scratching their heads, trying to figure out the way they're going to go. And this is where I first recognized things were not as normal. As I look out and I see this guy and this girl, they're maybe 20 years old. And they're out of the boat. And they're about maybe 40 or 50 yards above that vortex, just floating along. People are telling them, swim, swim to shore. And I'm standing there with my rope. And I'm going to ask, Matt, could you help me out? I'm going to show you exactly what happened, and hopefully I don't knock out that camera. But imagine that Matt represents that guy and that girl, and there's 50 people there. They're floating down, and I grab this rope, and I throw it. It was an anointed throw. And I yell, grab the rope, as it drapes right over both of their heads. And they grab the, they grab the rope, and I'm telling you what, it was like fish on <laughs> as I pulled both of them to shore. Thank you, Matt. And I, I went ahead and I reloaded the boat. I mean, reloaded the bag. No sooner had I reloaded the bag, and it goes right over the big drop. They did a pretty good job, except for this, this teenage kid. He falls out right there at the bottom of it. And, you know, if you go to the right, which is the obvious place for him to go, there's a back current that will suck him right into the throat, right into the deepest part of that vortex, and just suck him down. And so I scurry down the bank, and I make eye contact with him. I've got the rope right here. I look at him, and he's got this look in his eyes like, I'm going to die! And I got the rope, and I, I toss it to him. I said, grab the rope. And he grabs onto it, and I pull him to shore. And with that, all 50 people up on the shore, I'm getting this standing ovation. It's like, man, this feels really good. And as I reload the bag, I come back up on shore. This guy pats me on the back. He says, what's it feel like to be Superman? I'm going, I chuckled. I thought, man, Lord, this feels really good to be about rescuing people. People that don't know where they're heading. They're in a dangerous, precarious place. And the Lord spoke to me. He says, what you're doing with that rope right now, this is what I want you to do with your life. He's saying, this is what I want you to do with your life. Because there's people being carried down the current towards the vortex of hell. They don't even know the danger they're heading towards. And I want you to step up and throw the rope of my love, my grace, my mercy, my forgiveness. I want you to throw the rope. And that's exactly what I'm doing here today. Now, not everyone, I know what some of you are thinking. It's like, here we go. The pastor is telling us all how we got to go be evangelists again. Well, can I tell you, I understand. I've read the New Testament. I understand that not everybody uh, operates as an evangelist. But that doesn't mean we can't evangelize. Why is that? Well, I, bought a, I brought another rope here today. And I'm going to ask if Bradley, Bradley, can you come and join me this morning? Bradley, you've been with me a couple times down the river. I don't know if you've ever actually thrown one of these. But I can certainly testify that you are not a licensed river guide. Correct. Correct? So you really know very, very little about this. I know nothing. You know nothing about this. Well, let's see if I can coach you the basics. Can you hold on to one end? Yes. Okay. Are you right or left-handed? Well, for this right-handed. You're right-handed. Go ahead and grab the bag. And we need somebody to be, uh, to be our person. Is that going to be you, Paul? Okay. Why don't you get up here and you're, you're, getting, you're going down the river. 
and you're going to go a ways past so he can actually try throwing that thing a little bit. You're heading down that way. And he's going to get your attention. It's like he's going for a touchdown. <laughs> Hail Mary. He's going to yell, grab the rope. Grab the rope. Grab the rope. Now, Bradley, in the same way that it wasn't, you can go ahead and drop that, guys. We'll take care of that later. In the same way, you can have a seat. In the same way that that was not difficult to teach you to do that. It's not difficult to teach you how to cast out God's love, God's grace. What you've been touched with, he just says, take it and throw it out there. Because there are people being swept away. And they need to be rescued by my love. But for you to be a rescuer, you must first what? Have the heart of a rescuer. Because the fact is, if I didn't care, it wouldn't matter that those people were swimming out in the river. I would never throw the rope. And so for us to really be rescuers and be about his rescue mission, we must possess the heart of a rescuer. And obviously, Jesus is the great rescuer. Amen? So I want to talk with you a little bit about what does that heart look like. And the first thing is this, is that the heart of a rescuer has a passion for reaching people. He has a passion for reaching people. Can you say that with me, everybody? A rescuer has a what? A passion for reaching people. Now, uh, people have all kinds of passions. They have passions for their cool car. They have passions for their girlfriend. They have passions. Maybe, maybe you're a cat lover and you're passionate about your cats, right? Maybe you're like crazy cat lady. And, you, and your life revolves around your cats. Maybe you're passionate about your pizza. Oh, it's all about the anchovies. You got to have anchovies on the pizza. You name your passion. It doesn't take very long to find out people's passion. Because that's what they talk about in a relatively short period of time. But today, I want to talk with you about having a passion for reaching lost people. And I want to tell you a story, a personal story, of when that first began to settle into my heart. How that impacted me and what it felt like. This happened when my children, Joseph and Rochelle, they were young. They were little guys. And we went over to Blue Lake Park. Now, most of you, you've all been to, you know, you've been to Blue Lake. It's a big park. And we were down there along the beach. And Joseph and Rochelle, they're out there splashing around in the water. And uh, Kelly and I, we had taken our lawn chairs. And we're just sitting off the edge of the beach. And I'm right here in my lawn chair reading a book. And I've got one eye in my book, one eye on the kids. And if you know me, I can do that kind of thing with my eyes. It's really a gift. So I was really exercising my gift that day. One eye here, one eye over there. And, and I look up. I look up. And Joseph is gone. And if you're a parent, you know that feeling. They're in water. Where did he go? What happened to Joseph? And I'm not sure why I did, but I looked over that way. And I saw he was clear across the other side of the beach. And he was just cresting this grassy knoll. And he disappeared onto the other side. And I thought, I don't know who's over there. I don't know if there's a doctor. I don't know why he took off over there. I don't know what led him away. All I know is this. I felt this compelling emotion, this passion. I got to get to my son now. And I remember I got up, and I'm right on the edge of that hot sand. We all know what sand does on hot days, right? And that's a pretty long beach on a hot day. And I look, I go, that's the shortest path between me and where he just went. But the grass is over there. And I thought about it just for a split second. No, I must get to my son. And I began a pretty impressive sprint across the hot sand. I can tell you I would not have won a gold medal, but as far as I was concerned, it was a gold medal run. As I'm sprinting as fast as I can across that hot sand, I get to the other side to the grassy knoll up and over 
the other side, and there's Joseph. He just followed another kid. He found a kid to play with. I think there was a swing set or a slide. There was something for them to play with that interested them more at that moment. Get Joseph. I said, Joseph, we, we're going to head back, but we're not going to walk across the hot sand. We're going to walk through the grass. And when we got back to the other side, I went ahead and instructed him what his boundaries were, which probably would have been a good idea to do before he had taken off running, right? And so he's back to the water playing with his sister in, in the shallows right there. As I make my way back to my seat, and this was the, at the first moment that I began to realize that something had happened in that passionate moment of looking for my wayward son. As I start to, to limp, my feet are hurting. And I sat down in the chair and I looked at him. I said to my wife, I said, look at my feet. They're all blistered. I said, at the moment where I was so caught up in getting to Joseph, I didn't even realize I was blistering my feet. I was so caught up in the effort of finding my lost son. And as I sat down at that moment, Jesus said, this is exactly how it was for me with you. When I was hanging on a cross, I wasn't thinking about nails in my hands and my feet. I wasn't thinking about a crown of thorns on my head and how they mocked me. My focus was on you. I was so caught up in the passion of finding my lost son. That's what kept me there. It wasn't the nails. It was my love. It was my passion for you. That's what kept him there. And at that point, that's when this verse began to make sense to me, where it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. How many of you ladies have given birth to a baby? Raise him up high. I hear it's quite painful. Is it true? See, I've had a hangnail once that I thought was pretty painful. <laughs> My wife says, that ain't nothing. That is nothing. What is it that enables a woman to endure that pain? Because there's a vision. You know that on the other side of that pain, you're going to be holding your baby. You're going to be pulling it close, caressing it, kissing it, telling the child, I love you. And in the same way that it's that vision that enables a mom to endure the pain, it's God's vision of a relationship with you walking in friendship and intimacy with you that enabled him to endure the pain on the cross. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. That's awesome, amen? So it was his passion, it was his love that moved him. And you know, as you walk more deeply in a personal relationship with God, as you walk in more friendship and intimacy with him, as your passion for God develops, pretty soon you begin to develop a passion for what he's passionate about. So what is God passionate about? What does it say in Hebrews? It says that he's not wanting anyone to perish, for ev but for everyone to come to repentance. The Bible tells us all in Hebrews, or in John, it says this, to lift up your eyes and look at the fields, that they are white unto harvest. Now, I want to invite all of you that are sitting here with us right now. I'd like you to look to your left. There's people that live that direction. Go ahead and look to your right. There's people that live in that direction. The Bible would liken it to a harvest field. 
Go ahead and look over your shoulder if you can. And the Bible says this. It says to lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are white unto harvest. You know, if you talk to a farmer, what he will tell you about the harvest is this. Is that the harvest is ready when it's golden brown. When it is turned white, that's overripe. That's a harvest that's ready to be lost. So what he's saying is lift up your eyes and look at the harvest. It is white. All around us is a community that is ready to be lost. We have a community all around us that are re that's ready to be lost. You guys, you have been reconciled to God. You had a broken relationship with him, but because of your faith in him, you have been reconnected to God. You've been re-reconciled to him. And he says this about that, that you've been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus, and now God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? Jesus threw you the rope, and now he says, I want you to throw the rope. Throw the rope of my love. Throw the rope of my grace. God has given you the ministry of helping people connect with God. Now, the Bible says that he doesn't want anybody to perish, but everybody to come to repentance. So with that being said, how many does God want to go to hell? Who? How many? None. He says he doesn't want anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. And this is exactly why he came and went to the cross. And it's why he says, now you take the rope and you throw it. Because I don't want anybody to perish. I want everybody to come to repentance. This is why he went to the cross and why he's calling you and I to throw the rope. But the reality is this, is that you will not pick up your relationship with God, which I'm likening to a rope, the love, the mercy, and the grace you have received. You will not take that and deploy that into a lost world if you do not have a passion for what he's passionate about. He doesn't want anybody to come. You know, for three and a half years, Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He, he, he cured the leper. He fed the hungry and the multitudes. But it wasn't until Jesus was facing the cross that he said, but this is why I came right here. The healings, the miracles, the feeding the multitude, that's all icing on the cake. But my real motivation was to die on a cross, to deploy my life for lost people. Because I don't want anybody to perish and all to come to repentance. There's a second thing that we must have if we're going to have the heart of a rescuer. The first thing is this, that we would have a passion for him and that passion would grow and develop so that we're passionate about what he's passionate about. What is he passionate about? Reaching lost people. He came, and, he came to seek and save that which was lost. It's why he came. But it can't just stop at a passion. You must also have a compassion. Would you say that word with me, everybody? You must have a compassion. In Matthew, it says that Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. It says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's because of his passion for people he came, and it was because of his compassion that he took action. Now, Jesus shows us that two things work in tandem in kingdom ministry. It's the proclamation and the demonstration of the gospel. Now, at church, we're really good with the proclamation part. You need Jesus. Turn or burn. You know, the, some of the crazy things that churches can notoriously do. They just 
cram the message down people's throat, but they miss the demonstration of the gospel. It's not just a gospel that we talk about. It's a gospel that we demonstrate. We demonstrate it with transformed lives, through ministry, through service, taking the rope and casting it wildly to lost people. This rope will not throw itself. It will require a person who has a passion for people and a compassion and remembers, I remember what it was like to be there. If I don't have that, I'll never throw the rope. Do you remember what it was like to be the person that was lost? Do you remember? Too often we forget. And when we forget, our compassion evaporates. We must remember what it was like to be in that place and needing to know God. Because it's when you remember that you're able to take the rope and cast it to others. This rope won't throw itself. In this harvest, it will not self-reap. But it will self-destruct. See, it's not enough to simply have compassion. We must have that compassion move us to take action. You've heard, you've heard me say before that church is not a spectator sport, right? This church is only involved in ministry as you're involved in ministry. This church is only involved in outreach, serving the poor, caring for the needs of our community, as you are involved in those things. Why is that? Because you're the church. You are the church. And you know, the devil doesn't really care what we do inside the building. Quite frankly, I think the devil likes us to be in the church even longer, locked up inside. Because it really feels spiritual. He doesn't care if we dance around, shout hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you Jesus. You can even get slain in the spirit, going down under the Holy Ghost, speaking in new tongues. Devil doesn't care about any of that, as long as you just keep it in there. It may sound really compelling and spiritual to just stay in there, but that's not what the church was created to do. The church should be a place where we come, where we get equipped, we get anointed, and then we get released to go out and be Jesus to our community, Jesus to our neighbors. The Bible says that you are the salt of the earth. What good is salt that stays in a salt shaker? Your eggs still taste bland. The potatoes, the french fries, they taste bland. No, the salt needs to get out for it to season things. And the Bible says, you are the salt of the earth. We're meant to be shaken out. You ever feel like your life is kind of being shaken up a little bit? That might just be the Lord shaking you up and shaking you out to spice up this world. Let me read Jesus' prayer for his disciples, which how many of you are a follower of Jesus? Get, then you're a disciple. This is his prayer for you. He says, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. Interesting. We talk about how, how evil the world is. And Jesus is praying to the Father where he specifically says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Huh, okay. But that you would keep them safe from the evil one. As you have sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Have you guys ever considered that you have been deployed into the world by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And to what end? To take your rope and throw it. Throw his love, throw his grace, throw his mercy to everybody you know. To go out and live a contagious life to people. That was Jesus' point to the people. Now, in my house, we have a thermostat and we have a thermometer. And if I was to take a look at a thermometer right now, according to the hourly forecast, it should be about 78 degrees. 
I think the hourly forecast might be wrong. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> but in my house, I have a, a, a thermometer. That tells me what's the temperature. Oh, it's a little cold. Oh, it's a little hot. So then I have a thermostat that allows me to change the climate, change the temperature of the room. And you know, Christians and churches in particular, they've been operating as thermometers way too long. Oh, the world's a mess. The world's going to hell. People are a mess. And we talk about the climate of the world. And he says, I'm not just called you to sit around and tell everybody what the temperature of the world is. I want you to change it. You are thermostats that have been placed here by God himself to bring change to this world. We talked a little bit ago about how this, our community is the harvest field. And it's ripe. It's white under harvest. But would you consider this for a moment? That there is a harvest field that is harvestable. But that harvest field, which can be harvested, is only harvestable when harvesters go into the harvest field. I just said a lot, didn't I? There is a harvest field that's ready to self-destruct. And that field, which is ripe unto harvest, is only harvestable when we, as the harvesters, get out of the building and get into the field. That's what he's called us to do. That's what the body of Christ is all about. In Luke, it says this, that he told them that the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So who do you think he's asking to go? Send Billy Graham. He'll do it. Send this guy. Send that guy. No, he's sending us. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Verse 3, go, I am sending you. Would you say that with me? Go, I am sending you. P point to yourself. I am sending right here. I was going to tell you to point at the, ne the person next to you and say, go, I'm sending you. But we need to realize, me, he's sending me. And let me continue on what he says. Go, I'm sending you out like what? Lambs among wolves. And we go, time out. I was with you until you got to that part about lambs and wolves. Don't worry about that. I'm good. Until we got to that part about lambs and wolves. I know what wolves do to lambs. I don't want to go out there. I just want to stay in church all the time. It feels good. Just basking in the Holy Ghost. Can I just tell you, you are no ordinary lambs. You are lambs that are filled with the Spirit. You are lambs that got the full armor of God. You got the sword of the Spirit. And don't miss the most important part of that, where he says what? Go, I am sending you. Who the Lord appoints, the Lord anoints. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So when he calls us to go into the harvest field, you're not going by yourself. You've got the Spirit of God living in you. So we can go boldly. You may be the only Bible some of your friends ever read. You may be the only Jesus some of you see. Your friends are never closer to Jesus than when they're standing right next to you. Why do I say that? Because if Jesus is in you, then everywhere you go, Jesus is there. When you go out to lunch after church today, Jesus is going out to lunch today after church. When you're standing in the line at Winco, Jesus is there 
because you're there and he's in you. And everybody who's around you at that moment, they're standing next to Jesus. When you're at the gas station or wherever you go, the people that you encounter, they're never closer to him at that moment than when they're standing next to you. You and I have been called to represent Jesus to this world. And you can't do that just hiding out in there. That's why I often say our most important part of our service is just about to come. It's the part where we pray and we say amen and we send you out into this world. And he says, go, I'm sending you. The question is not whether or not there's a need. Just lift up your eyes and look. Read the 6 o'clock news. What's going on? The field is white. It's ready to be lost. Let that compel you. Let his passion seep deep into your heart. Let this relationship you have with him begin to grow some authentic shoe leather. We get equipped, we get anointed, and then we get released to go out and be Jesus to this world. Is that important? You better believe it. Because this harvest will self-reap, but it will self-destruct. This rope won't throw itself. You don't need to be a, cert a certified raft guide to learn how to throw a rope. And you don't have to go to Bible college for four years to begin to throw out God's love, his grace, his forgiveness. You just need to be a person who's experienced it. And then you have a passion and a compassion enough to not keep it to yourself. The most important part of our service is about to begin. I'm going to ask if we could stand to our feet. And I know for those of you that are huddled under this tarp, it might be a little funny there. I'll, I'll let you guys, you guys can, there you go. That's working. That works. It floats up. Would you, could you stretch your hands this direction? And I'm going to stretch my hands your direction. To a certain degree, to a certain degree, God has gifted me with evangelism. It's a natural thing for me. For many pastors, it creates stress and anxiety for them. It doesn't do that for me. That doesn't make me better. It just makes me gifted differently. And Ephesians, it says that God has given to the church as gifts. Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, all kinds of people for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so God's plan is, uh, is not that he would take somebody who's naturally gifted with evangelism and say, you're the evangelist for the church. If my job is to equip saints for the work of the ministry, that I hope in some degree today there's an imparting and e an equipping that's taking place. In the same way that I gave Bradley just enough information and enough training to throw that rope, that today I've given you enough to just stir up your compassion and your passion, and now I release you to be a partner, not a bystander. A partner, not a spectator. Lord, I want to pray for my church family. The relationships that we have, whether it be with our wayward children, the person at the check stand at Winco, Albertsons or Safeway, the guy pumping gas at the 76 gas station, or Shell or wherever you frequent, 
the person that lives next door to you, the people that are in your life, that you bump into in life, they have been strategically placed there by God so that you and I, as representatives of Jesus in this world, can show his light, show his goodness. So, Lord, I want to pray now as my church family stretches forth their hands that this would be a moment for us to get equipped, anointed, and to be released. To go deploy your love, your forgiveness, your grace, your message into this world. That we would possess the heart of a rescuer. And you are the great rescuer. And your heart was moved by passion and compassion. You didn't just preach it, but you did it. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to go out and be Jesus to this world. Where scripture talks about this lost and dying world in which we shine like stars in this universe. Let our lights shine in Jesus' name.